Okay, welcome to the beginning of the, the new semester, the new year. Um, welcome to Hottest. Uh, this week's speaker is Johan Kamelin from the University of Freiburg, and his title is The Liquid Tensor Experiment. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak for you. Um, I want to tell you something about the largest collaborative project that I've participated in so far, uh, the liquid tensor experiment. And it all started with uh, a challenge that Peter Schultz posted online on 5 December 2020. And you should know that uh, I'm Dutch. And on 5 December in the Netherlands, we uh, celebrate Sinterklaas, which is uh, a traditional feast where everybody uh, like organizes parties to give presents to each other. And so I interpreted this as the Sinterklaas present that Peter Schulze gave me that year. So the challenge was uh, check the main theorem of liquid vector spaces on a computer. And uh, for this audience, I don't really have to explain what uh, computer proof verification means. So I'll skip that part. So but um, nine days later, the following picture was uh, posted on Twitter. And uh, so these are four uh, rock stars. For those of you who don't know what a rock star is, think a Fields medalist, but in music. And um, these, these four guys form, uh, form a band called the Liquid Tension Experiment. And so the background story is the following. In 1998, this band, uh, Post, released their first album, The Liquid Tension Experiment. One year later, they released the album Liquid Tension Experiment 2. And by induction, you can sort of see where this is going, except that um, there was a radio silence for more than 20 years. And it took a Fields medalist to write uh, a blog post to get them back in action. Because nine days after Schultz wrote this blog post, they announced that they would release their third album. And uh, that happened about half a year later with uh, some tracks that were very inspiring while we were working on the actual liquid tensor experiment, including names such as solid resolution theory, beating the odds, and shades of hope. And in 2022, we actually completed the liquid tensor experiment, the formal verification of the main theorem of liquid vector spaces. So let me go in a bit more detail about uh, what all went into this and, and what the background, the mathematical background is of the whole story. So why would you want to care about liquid vector spaces? Uh, I'll give you two reasons and try to explain them in a bit more detail. So liquid vector spaces allow you to embed uh, real and complex manifolds into a unifying category of geometric objects called, uh, these are so-called analytic spaces that uh, are being developed by Schultz and Clausen uh, over the past two, three years. And um, so there are all sorts of geometric objects. Real manifolds are certainly the most well, well known, but there are schemes, um, there's piadic geometry where you have uh, perfectoid spaces and things like that. And these used to be all sorts of separate categories with maybe some functors between them, but now there is one big category that includes all of these geometric objects. Um, and to show that real and complex manifolds fit inside this big framework, uh, you need to prove a really hard theorem about liquid vector spaces. Um, the other reason why you might want to care about liquid vector spaces is if you're interested in functional analysis and you want to use algebraic methods such as homological algebra, then this is a very nice category to do functional analysis and use uh, tools from homological algebra. So what, what is the, the problem that we're trying to solve? And the, the very, very basic problem is the following thing. Uh, when you're trying to mix topo topology and algebra, for example, uh, you might want to work with uh, topological abelian groups. Well, here are two examples of topological abelian groups. We take the real numbers, and on the left-hand side, we consider them as a discrete group with a discrete topology. And on the right-hand side, 
with the usual metric topology. And then we take the identity map between them. This is going to be a this is a continuous morphism. Um, it's clearly injective and it looks like it's surjective. So if it were injective and surjective and topological abelian groups would be a nice category, then it would also be an isomorphism, but it's clearly not an isomorphism. There is no continuous inverse. So what this means is that the category of topological abelian groups is not an abelian category. The isomorphism theorem fails. And that's sort of a very, very baby case example of a problem that shows up all over the place when you try to use uh, tools from category theory, uh, you just run into the issue that the categories are not nice enough to apply these tools. And about four years ago, uh, Dustin Clausen realized uh, that a solution might come from using tools that Schultz had developed together with Bardav Bhatt for the pro etal topology. And so since then, he has been working together with Schultz on condensed mathematics. And liquid mathematics is a, is a part of condensed mathematics. So how does that work? Um, I'm not going to give you like a full course on condensed mathematics, but I'll try to give some of the flavors. So a condensed set is a functor, uh, a contravariant functor from profinite sets to the category of sets, satisfying a certain sheaf condition. And um, I'm not going to go into the details of the sheaf condition, but uh, the nice thing is that the category of condensed sets will be a category of sheaves, hence a topos, hence it will have very nice properties. And the Yonada embedding, you can extend it to the category of topological spaces, and this will give you uh, a functor from the category of topological spaces to the category of condensed sets. And so you would want to view condensed sets as sets together with some topological source. And if you then consider sheaves with values in uh, the category of abelian groups. Oh, wait, one second. I wanted to say a bit more about condensed sets. I forgot. Yeah, so so actually this, um, this category really is an alternative to the category of topological spaces in the sense that, uh, well, we all know that the category of topological spaces uh, isn't really a very nice category and we often restrict to categories of certain other objects, for example, the category of compact Hausdorff objects or weakly Hausdorff compactly generated objects. And these are actually very much related to the category of condensed sets. So if you take the category of condensed sets and you look at all the quasi compact, quasi separated objects inside of it, that's exactly equivalent to the category of compact Hausdorff spaces via this Yonada embedding that I mentioned on the previous slide. And if you release, uh, if you uh, sort of weaken this condition of quasi-compactness and you only consider quasi-separated condensed sets, then you will recover a category, category that is uh, that contains all the weakly Hausdorff compactly generated uh, topological spaces. Um, and actually, so it's not exactly the same category, but it's actually a category with slightly better properties um, because in the category of weakly Hausdorff compactly generated spaces, uh, certain uh, certain uh, maps are uh, certain spaces are certain. I should say certain limits are identified that shouldn't be, and so you have just not enough objects. Whereas in condensed sets, all the objects that you want to see are there. Right, so then if you look at abelian group objects in condensed sets, or you take abelian sheaves, then this will be an abelian category because it's a category of abelian sheaves. Uh, but it's not just uh, an abelian category. It satisfies a lot of the nice properties that Grothen listed in his famous Tohoku uh, article on abelian categories. And so every, whenever you consider Abelian, uh, abelian group objects in a topos, the resulting category will be an abelian category, satisfying a whole list of con conditions about which limits and co-limits exist and are exact, etc. Um, and so 
it will always satisfy these four. But in the case of condensed abelian groups, it even satisfies uh, two more of these properties. So it's a particularly nice category. Um, so sort of with this very quick uh, introduction into condensed mathematics, I want to give a very high level overview of what happens with these analytic spaces. So for that, we need first to know what an analytic ring is because we follow the uh, well-known pattern of first having rings and then taking some sort of spectrum and then gluing these together into spaces. And an analytic ring is a condensed ring, so which you can think of as a ring with some topological flavor, uh, together with a completion functor for the modules over that ring. And that completion functor that has to satisfy some properties that are not completely trivial to write down, so I'll skip that. But there are a lot of examples, and first of all, every discrete ring can, tri can be trivially made into an analytic ring. Um, but then all sorts of p-adic rings, like the p-adic integers or QP or other local fields, uh, extensions of QP, et cetera, they are also very naturally examples of analytic rings. And uh, so there, there you see that we're mixing algebra and topology. And so every analytic ring has an analytic spectrum. And then you glue these together to get analytic spaces. And because every discrete ring is an example of an analytic ring, uh, you'll see that schemes uh, are automatically analytic spaces. But for example, if you take completions of rings, that will be topological rings. And completions of rings are used to build formal schemes. So formal schemes, um, like the, these topological rings that are completions of uh, ordinary rings, they are naturally analytic rings, and hence formal schemes are naturally analytic spaces. Um, but also Berkovich spaces, attic spaces, stuff that shows up in p adic geometry, because all these p adic rings are naturally analytic rings, they all fit in this world of analytic spaces. And then the question is, okay, but what about real uh, and complex manifolds? And so that those are geometric objects where you want to use the topology on the real numbers and by extension, the complex numbers. So you would want um, the real numbers as an algebraic object together with the topological flavor coming from the metric topology to be turned into an analytic ring. And that's what, well, that's sort of what the foundation of liquid mathematics is all about. So let's think a little bit about, as I said, analytic rings are, uh, condensed rings together with a completion functor for their modules. So in the case of R, we would need a way to complete real vector spaces. And this is something, well, that's one of the fundamental things happening in functional analysis. So without giving you the precise definition of an analytic ring, I'll try to explain a kind of the flavor of what we are looking for. So, um, the whole theory is based on profinite sets. Um, I mean, we're looking at sheaves on the category of profinite sets. I didn't really say what a profinite set is actually, um, but it's it's also not so important. It's some kind of topological space. Um, and then the first uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to consider uh, a real vector space generated by S. And so that would be this free vector space generated by S, which we can think of as the space of linear combinations of Dirac measures. And if we want to be able to complete vector spaces, we better be able to complete this particular vector space. And a very natural candidate uh, for completing it is, well, we have linear combinations of Dirac measures. Let's just take a space of all measures that contains this uh, RS. And so we take the space of signed Radon measures. And now we would need to check a certain condition to see whether um, 
these are good candidates for completions of the spaces RS. And so the condition, um, first of all, would mean that we have a certain extension property. So whenever we have a, a continuous function from S to V, that's sort of, well, we're sending every point to some element of, of some object V. We can also send that point to its Dirac measure inside the space of all radon measures. And we would want a unique extension of this function F to the space of all radon measures. And what does that mean? It means that there is a unique way to integrate measures against F. So you take a measure mu and you send it to the integral of uh, FST mu. And I mean, this is of course just notation, but it, if, the, if such a unique extension exists, it's very natural to call it, uh, well, a way of integrating measures. And in other words, what we want is that uh, a homomorphism from this free vector space to V, which is of course, by a junction, the same thing as a map from S to V, is naturally isomorphic to homomorphisms from the space of Radon measures to V. But we don't only want that, we sort of want this to hold in the derived world as well. So even if we take derived functors of, of these home functors, it should still work. And um, on the left-hand side, uh, so the derived functors of the home functors are X groups. And on the left-hand side, the X groups vanish uh, because we're, yeah, I mean, it's not completely trivial because um, it's not actually true that RS is a projective object, um, but it's close enough that you can show that uh, these the X groups on the left-hand side all vanish. So besides just having this extension property, we also want all the higher X groups to vanish uh, on the right-hand side. And so that's a natural condition to add. And if that works, then uh, we would have turned the real numbers into an analytic ring. So just to clarify, uh, the hum on the left is just linear homomorphisms, but on the right, you want continuous linear homomorphisms. Is that correct? Um, or... Well, no, not exactly, actually. Uh, so in both cases, you would want this to happen in the category of condensed sets, uh, or sorry, condensed vector spaces. And so they're naturally in sort of continuous. Um, also, so also this map F is a continuous map from S to V. So V will be a real vector space. And it, so it will be a topological vector space, but I didn't really specify what kind of spaces V I'm actually interested in here. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to focus on that now. So the whole formalism of analytic rings, like this abstract definition basically forces you to consider a really large class of topological vector spaces. And in particular, you have to work with topological vector spaces that are not locally convex, which is something that is usually avoided in, in functional analysis. Um, more precisely, we'll need to consider uh, so-called quasi Banach spaces or, or p Banach spaces uh, in cases where this parameter P is a real number that is strictly less than one. So what does it mean? It means that we're looking at complete topological vector spaces whose topology is induced by a P norm, which means it satisfies all the usual axioms for a norm, except that the axiom where you uh, describe what happens if you pull a scalar multiplication out of a norm Usually you would expect, well, you just multiply by the absolute value of the scalar. But now you multiply by the absolute value of the scalar raised to the power P. And because, uh, because P is less than one, um, if you think of it about what happens to the unit ball in, in examples where you have this scaling behavior, it means that the unit ball will be, uh, will be non-convex. So you'll have these star-shaped unit balls. And that means that all sorts of techniques from uh, convex geometry cannot be used when working with these spaces. But on the other hand, the promise is that 
if the whole theory works out, the, even though you have to work with these objects that are not so nice, the resulting category will be extremely nice. And um, it will allow you to use all sorts of results and tools from category theory and homological algebra, et cetera. So then the next speed bump is that the entropy function uh, between L1 space and L2 space can be used to show that actually the space of uh, signed Radon measures does not satisfy this required universal property. So we were looking for a completion of the space of uh, like this freely generated real vector space. And we thought, okay, well, we'll view it as linear combinations of Dirac measures, and then just take the space of all Radon measures as its completion. Um, but it almost works, it just doesn't work. And so the result uh, or, or the solution is to work with a space that is uh, that is somewhat smaller. So instead, we we need to use uh, the space of signed Radon meshes that satisfy a certain um, LP prime convergence condition. And uh, in this case, P prime, well, here, here we it doesn't really matter yet, but when we want to work, uh, make the whole theory work out, we'll need to choose P prime smaller than the P that occurred on the previous slide for the P Vana space. And even then there is a, a tiny white lie. So actually you need to take a co-limit of, of all these spaces for all P primes less than P. Um, but yeah, let's ignore that for now. So the, the whole point is that um, we also need to compromise on the side of the Radon measures and work with a space that is slightly uglier than we're used to. Um, but then we get the following theorem. So if we have uh, two real numbers, P prime and P that are between zero and one and P prime is less than P, and S is a profinite set, and V is a P Banach space, and M P prime is the space of P prime measures on S, then uh, the following condition holds, namely that all higher X groups between M P prime of S and V vanish in the category of condensed abelian groups. And from this theorem, you can show that uh, if you take the co-limit over all these MP primes, then they th those co-limits form a really good uh, completion of the, the vector space RS. Okay, so this is uh, some abstract theorem about, uh, uh, about these real vector space, condensed real vector spaces. And um, the promise is that that means that the real numbers uh, become an analytic ring and hence uh, you can apply all these tools about homological algebra to functional analysis and also the real and complex manifolds become parts of this unifying geometric framework. So this is what is called the, the main theorem of liquid vector spaces. And this is the theorem that Schultz challenged us to uh, formally verify on a computer. Right, so once you have that, so let me, let me explain a little bit uh, what the resulting theory, the theory of liquid vector spaces uh, has as properties. So you get this category of uh, sort of P liquid vector spaces, which are P complete in some sense, inside the category of condensed real vector spaces. And so it's an abelian category, that's the least you would wish, but uh, it's also closed under all limits, co-limits and extensions, which means that if you start with some liquid vector spaces and then you perform some construction on them as if they were uh, just arbitrary condensed real vector spaces, then the resulting object that comes out of that construction is almost always guaranteed uh, to be a P-liquid vector space again. Um, the only thing not listed here is uh, tensor products. And that's actually by design because the tensor product of real vector spaces is very ugly. It, it acts as if it's just 
the ordinary algebraic tensor product, which is usually not what you want. You want the tensor product of complete things to be complete. So you need to apply a completion functor to the algebraic tensor product, and then you'll be back in the liquid world. So it depends on this parameter P. And if you vary the parameter P, then the categories of liquid vector spaces will be nicely containing each other. And examples are uh, Banach spaces, nuclear crochet spaces, uh, Smith spaces, all sorts of objects that uh, naturally occur in, uh, in functional analysis are examples of liquid vector spaces. And the liquid tensor product is compatible with the topological tensor product of nuclear Fourier spaces. So in functional analysis, there are at least seven different tensor products, but all seven tensor products, uh, this was one of the results of Grotendieck's uh, PhD thesis, actually, which he wrote in functional analysis. So all these uh, topological tensor products, they, are, they do the same thing when you apply them to nuclear Fourier spaces. And so it's a very good sign that this unique tensor product on liquid spaces is the one that were, that is the one, uh, is compatible with the one on nuclear Fourier spaces. So on on liquid vector spaces, the tensor product is just defined to satisfy the Hom tensor adjunction. So it's uniquely correct characterized by uh, well. The internal home functor can only do one thing, and so the tensor product can also only do one thing by a junction. And uh, so it's very well behaved from a categorical point of view, and it's compatible with what happens in functional analysis. If you restrict to, to the category of spaces where all the known tensor products also agree on what to do. And so the summary is that the there is a liquid analytic ring structure on the real numbers uh, that gives a, gives a really nice category of liquid vector spaces. So that was my crash course on the background of liquid mathematics. And now I want to say a bit more about the experiment. So Schultz in his blog post gave some motivations for why he, uh, why he posted the challenge and why he wanted a computer verification. So he wrote that um, he spent mo much of the year 2019 obsessed with the proof of this theorem and almost getting crazy over it. And the proof has some very unexpected features. So it doesn't follow well-known patterns in, uh, well, any area of mathematics basically. Uh, so it's a theorem about the real numbers, but to prove it, you have to pass to number theoretic rings and proof stuff there. And then in the end, use the results about combinator from combinatorics uh, to finish the proof. Uh, he claims that uh, it may be his most important theorem to date. And he think back then he said, I think nobody else has dared to look at the details. So I still have some small lingering doubts. And uh, yeah, so that was, those were reasons for him to uh, challenge the uh, computer proof verification communities to uh, look at this theorem and verify it on the computer. So here's a reminder, this was the, the main theorem that he challenged us to, uh, to verify. And this is sort of, a, it's an abstract statement. I mean, you need these ext functors and you need condensed abelian groups and all this stuff, but it's a pretty clean statement in some sense. Uh, but after a few steps on paper, the, it reduces to a very technical statement, which is the following slide, uh, where suddenly you have an extremely messy complex with all sorts of parameters appearing. And this complex has to satisfy a certain exactness uh, condition. And now all the objects in, this, in these complexes uh, actually, it's a system of complexes. So for every parameter C, you have a complex, and all these complexes consist of uh, norm abelian groups. And so this exactness condition is an exactness condition in terms of the norm and uh, stuff like that. I'm not going to go into details, but towards the end of the talk, I'll 
try to explain why it's actually a natural condition to, to require. Um, but so we made this really technical theorem the first target, target of our project. And um, we focused on verifying that first. But because it's such a messy statement, I mean, the dot, 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 of course, also hides a, a bunch of complexity. Um, to be sure that if we verified this, that we didn't actually make mistakes in how to verify uh, or how to uh, input the statement into the computer, um, we actually then continued to the main theorem, which is also the reason why Schultz challenged us to, to check that part. He wasn't really concerned about the paper proof of that reduction step. All the technicalities are in the proof of this theorem, but um, it's a lot easier to verify that we got the statement right uh, for the other theorem. So um, what happened? Well, we first worked on this first target, which we completed after about six months in like on May, uh, May 29 of 2021. And then um, this reduction step, which on paper is like half a page, it took us basically a full year to verify that because we, we had to develop a lot of prerequisite material. We had to develop a whole bunch of topos theory and homological algebra, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to talk about X, fun, uh, yeah, X groups in the category of condensed abelian groups, et cetera. So that took us a while, but um, we finished that about half a year ago. And uh, so along the way, some statements and proofs of lemmas and, uh, and some of the auxiliary definitions were changed in, uh, in the lecture notes that Schultz had written about uh, liquid mathematics. And we now have a very detailed blueprint um, that was, I mean, we called it a blueprint, but it never really was a blueprint because it was more developed along and after formalizing the mathematics. Um, but it's so there is a LaTeX document that contains a very detailed version of the proof. Um, we were able to answer a question uh, about some technical constants that show up in the proof that uh, that Schultz had asked. Um, there, there's a tool from homological algebra called Green Deline resolutions uh, that requires a bunch of homotopy theory to prove it. And we found uh, an alternative to these so-called green deline resolutions that doesn't require any homotopy theory and uh, is just as useful for this proof. So in some sense, it got simplified. And finally, um, at the moment, I'm working together with Reed Barton to uh, try to conceptualize some parts of the proof and to see if we can distill um, parts of the proof into a more human readable and human understandable Prove that so that we don't really need to rely on uh, a computer verification to be sure that we understand what's going on and, and why the result is true. So I want to say a little bit about the these last two items. I'll quickly show what our alternatives to green deline resolutions is, and then say a bit more about uh, how we're trying to uh, extract extract some, some more conceptual ideas out of the proof. So um, green deline resolutions. It's a, it's a theorem that isn't really written down anywhere in the literature. So I think the main reference is now an appendix to one of Schultz's lecture notes, which says that if you have an abelian group A, then you can form a a resolution by taking the natural subjection from uh, the free abelian group generated by A onto A. And so, uh, yeah, this, this sends a linear combination of uh, a formal linear combination to the actual sum. So you just evaluate it. And in particular, uh, you can see that uh, what the kernel is, if you uh, you can subject onto that by uh, taking the free abelian group generated by A squared. 
by sending uh, the generator a comma b to the following thing. You take uh, the, the class of a plus the class of b minus the class of a plus b. So it's clear that if you take the class of a plus the class of b minus the class of a plus b, uh, that will evaluate to zero if you send it through this evaluation map. And so certainly uh, this map lands in the kernel and it's actually everything. And then the next step you can still do by hand. You can sort of describe what the kernel of this map is and find that uh, this direct sum uh, will subject onto the kernel of, the, uh, of, of this differential. And after that, it becomes a nightmare and there's no way you can actually really do stuff by hand anymore. And so you have to rely on a bunch of homotopy theory to show that you can actually continue this in such a way that it's completely independent of the group A you started with, and you actually get something that is uh, completely functorial in A. So we were like, I mean, this is just beautiful mathematics, but if you need to formalize something and it requires like, half a year of prerequisites, uh, half a year of work as prerequisites in homotopy theory, um, we decided, well, maybe we just use this as a black box and we'll write down the statement and then just turn it into an axiom and use that. But once we'd written down the statement, I started playing around a bit with like what the options were because I, ma I made all these exponents, variables, et cetera, and just demanded some conditions to be true. And um, I, I, rediscovered, uh, I rediscovered an object that McLean has constructed ages ago. It's called Mac McLean's Q construction. And it starts out the same way, but then it continues in a quite a bit, uh, quite a bit easier way. So all the exponents are just powers of two. And it's a very simple and natural object. It's also completely factorial in A. The only downside is it's not a resolution. It's just a complex. But um, while playing with it, uh, so Schultz and I realized that it has the property we want. Namely, if all the higher X groups vanish when you use this complex as a sort of pseudo resolution, then also all the higher X groups uh, of A and B vanish. So if you're interested in proving that certain higher X groups vanish, uh, then usually you would replace A by a resolution. And in this case, well, it doesn't matter that it's not actually a resolution. Um, we can still prove that it works if you if you use this complex. And so- Can I, can I just who, ask for yeah, clarification? Sure. The, the second last line when you write X die Q prime A, uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess you mean you take the complex Q prime A, you hom into B, and you take the ith cohomology of that? Right, if you take homes in the in the derived category. So, oh, so, not, in, so... Not, not in the category of chain complexes, you have to like invert weak equivalences, et cetera, before taking the home. Well, I mean, the normal way I would compute X die of A would be to take a projective resolution of A. Just exactly. Take level wise hom into B and take the cohomology. Right. And so you're, is that the same thing that I would be doing? I would just use the Q prime A instead of the usual projective resolution? Um, or not? Yes and no. Uh, like formally, whenever you have a complex here, you would have to take a projective replacement of that complex and then home that into B. Okay, so you need something more sophisticated, yeah. Yeah. Which means that basically you haven't really gotten anywhere uh, because like first you had to do a projective resolution of A. Now you need to take a projective replacement of this complex. So it wouldn't really help. But then um, for the specific A that we are interested in, we can show that Q prime of A is an acyclic complex uh, or, or a complex of acyclic objects. Mm -hmm. And so then you actually don't need to do the projective replacement. And we can just take the home into B and, and take homology. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. So yeah, I'm, I'm hiding some stuff under the rug, but uh, yeah. 
and, and so proving this, proving that uh, the MacLean Q construction satisfies this property is it uses very basic homological algebra. So we had to develop that anyway. And, uh, and so, yeah, this uh, made it possible for us to have like a completely axiom free. Okay, when I say axiom free, of course, I allow myself to use the axiom of choice, et cetera. But we didn't accept any other black, like black boxes as we initially feared that we had to do. Okay, and then um, the question, uh, like, can we find a proof that does not really need computer verification? That is, I mean, I, I work a lot with computer verification and uh, I really love it, but what, what do we want of a proof? I think a proof has two purposes. First of all, it, uh, it's meant to convince you that a certain result is true but hopefully it also will shed some light on why the result is true. So, so we want both the fact that it's a, it's a witness of truth and that it, shed, that it gives insight or that you can learn something from it, or get new ideas. And Schultz also complained that like the proof is not much fun and it barely fits in, into your RAM uh, as a human being. So, um, yeah, then after we had this uh, proof completely done in Lean, um, Reed Barton came to Freiburg and we started discussing like, um, what can we actually understand of this proof? And can we use the Lean proof to sort of uh, fact, fact check ideas that we have about how to conceptualize or simplify parts of the proof? So I'll, we're not, this is very much work in progress. So I'll, uh, present some thoughts, uh, but where there's still plenty of rough edges where we haven't worked out exactly how to make things work. So we go back to this very technical theorem 9.4, where we have this really crazy system of complexes where all the gadgets inside the complexes are norm to in groups. And then we had a very wacky exactness condition that I didn't really uh, tell you what it was. So, but if we assemble all these system of complexes sort of in one big package, then every object, that, then we get one big chain complex where every object is a functor from uh, non-negative real numbers to non debilling groups, a contravariant functor. So all like all the this system of complexes, all, all the complexes were indexed by this little c, which was a real number, or a, a non-negative real number. And so now instead of like taking all these different complexes, I want to sort of make, make one big complex of chunks where the objects are now functors into non debilling groups. And then the theorem claims that this complex is in some sense exact. Okay, so we're just going to stare at these objects a bit and uh, think a little bit about some, uh, some logic. So we have, we have functors, so we can, we can think of this as like non debelian group valued pre-sheaves on the non-negative reals. And uh, so on these objects, we have a metric. And so that suggests that we can sort of try to mix uh, the internal logic of sheaf categories or pre-sheaf categories, so sheaf semantics, and on the other hand, uh, continuous logic, which exists for, for metric spaces. So let me sort of give a very brief introduction to both of these by looking at an example, namely, what does it mean for something to be exact? So suppose that we have uh, three of these functors, A, B, and C, and we have two morphisms between them, F and G. Then the following formula claims that uh, this is exact at B. So for all B, uh, G, B is zero, entails that uh, there exists an A such that F, A is B. And for certain reasons we don't use the implication symbol, but 
but uh, we, we use sequence with a turnstile. And so in the sheaf semantics, this would interpret to saying that, uh, let's look at the second line first, um, for all B at a certain stage S, so S is now like an element of the index category, um, if GB is zero, then there exists an A such that FA is equal to B, except that this A doesn't have to live at the same stage, right? In sheaf semantics, you're allowed, when you want to say that something is subjective, you don't say it's subjective on the nose, you're allowed to pass to, like refine to a, to a different cover. And so that here, we do that in, uh, in a slightly different way. So we don't just say, well, you can pass to any other stage, but we want to say that there exists a constant K such that uh, for all S large enough, this condition holds where you are now allowed to pass to, to find your witness for the existential, you're allowed to pass to stage K times S. And then, uh, wait, did I mess things up? Oh, wait, no, no, this should, okay, we sometimes switch back and forth between dividing by k and multiplying by k, and now I did the wrong thing. So I need to divide by k, and then the restriction should also be on the other side. Sorry, I messed this up. The other option would be to say that you multiply by k uh, at the stage where you pick your b. Uh, sorry, I messed up this formula. At least I think the idea is clear that you're allowed to make a stage change before you find the witness of your for your existential. And so the other idea about continuous logic is so there we we forget about the stages and we just think about non-revealing groups. So again we have A, B, C, and we have F and G. And then we have the same sequence uh, claiming exactness of uh, F and G. And so again, let's first look at the second line. So now we say for all B, um, there exists an A such that, and then some inequality has to hold. And we want that this holds. Uh, so there is sort of a, a Lipschitz constant that you see more often when you think about like Lipschitz continuity, etc. You have a constant k appearing that um, your your statement about all b etc has to be uniform in this k. And so, what is like? How does this work? What is the reasoning behind this? So, in continuous logic, you uh, don't have just two truth values, true and false, but every statement uh, sort of get a measurement for how false it is. And if the falsitude is zero, that means it's true. And then the fal falsitude can grow to infinity. Um, and for example, you measure how true the statement X is equal to Y is by looking at the distance or how false, I should say, how false the statement X is equal to Y is measured by the distance between X and Y. And if this distance is zero, it means that X is equal to Y. It's actually true. So the falsitude of X is equal to Y would then be zero. And so now if we look at that, then we see, okay, here we're claiming uh, GB is equal to zero. And here we see the distance between GB and zero. And here we're claiming FA is equal to B. And here we see uh, the distance between FA and B. So what we're saying is that um, the infimum over all distances between F, A, and B is less than K times uh, the distance of G, B to zero. And if you expand that infimum, then you get a statement that for all epsilon, there exists an A such that this distance is less than K times this distance plus this little epsilon. So the existential sort of interprets as an infimum. And then you have to, uh, you claim that the infimum of the, well, sorry, the infimum of these distances 
which is the interpretation of this side of the sequent, is less than the distance at the left hand side of the sequent. Okay, and so you can do this for all sorts of both the sheaf semantics and the continuous logic. You can do this for um, several uh, logical ingredients. So I mean, we talked about equality, existential, the turn style, and for all. And that's basically everything we need. So that's why I just only demonstrate this one example. Um, and then, of course, both of them come with soundness theorems about all the all the rules of uh, the logic that you want to use. And so we don't use full first order logic. We basically use regular logic. Um, but I don't want to go into details of this soundness proof, et cetera, because that's pretty tedious and boring, I think. But the whole idea is that now we want to combine these two things. We want to combine this, this stage direction where we have this sort of sheaf semantics and the continuous logic on the uh, with involving the, the norms or the norm defining groups. And if you combine the two, then you the, the statement that something is exact exactly interprets to the normed exactness condition that is needed for this chain complex in uh, theorem 9.4. And so what is the upshot of this? It means that we can now compile all sorts of proofs from homological algebra results about chain complexes into this normed and sheafy setting. And for example, the snake lemma, uh, stuff about long exact sequences, homology groups, uh, spectral sequence arguments, etc., cetera, um, all sort of just become, take the usual proof, run it through this interpreter and outrules a statement in this, uh, in this weird normed, uh, normed and sheafy setting. And, um, that already clarified several uh, lemma statements and proofs. And it actually shows that certain lemma statements um, are suboptimal and, and as they occur in the blueprint and, and the way we formalize them in lean and uh, a slight tweak would make them uh, easier to prove because you can use this interpreter stuff and, uh, and still just as powerful to apply them. However, uh, at one point in the in the sort of global proof structure, this strategy fails. And at some point, we need to make a certain norm estimate that really exploits the fact that sort of these truth values are now not just true and false, um, but you have this cont continuity to work with. And so that that step is just not just simply the interpretation of an internal reasoning step. And we have some ideas how it, like how we could uh, fit that into our logic using a model operator, but there are some nasty edges that we, some speed bumps that we haven't really worked out yet. So this is very much work in progress. Um, but uh, yeah, so so that if that works out, then we have a sort of machine to to compile ordinary homological algebra results into a, uh, a global proof structure. But I want to make it very clear that this doesn't mean that the whole proof would become just a formality because um, inside this global proof structure that would use these logics, you still need uh, at certain points to use like actual real hard ingredients. And so at a, crucial point, you actually need to use some uh, stuff from combinatorics, something called Gordon's lemma. Uh, you have to, that, that's also the point where you use that you've reduced from the real numbers to a discrete setting over like using power series with integer coefficients so that you can actually apply combinatorics to truncated power series and things like that. And, um, you also, at certain points, need to uh, use facts about cohomology of profinite sets as input. So what we hope to do is use this logic to clarify, OK, these are the core ingredients that you need to use. And for the rest, you can just compile well-known results from homological algebra into this norm setting and uh, 
put that together to, uh, to make this proof work. Okay, so I think the, the lessons that I draw from this uh, experiment, uh, first of all, is that uh, some state-of-the-art mathematics uh, can be formalized in a very reasonable amount of time. Uh, especially the fact that this crazy technical statement was done in half a year uh, uh, very much surprised me. I expected to be working for two years on it. Um, and what really surprised me was that Lean was really very much a proof assistant. And this, uh, I mean, interactive theorem provers at such are called proof assistants uh, now and then. And I usually think that this is a bit of a misnomer because they're just extremely pedantic and not really assisting you in understanding the mathematics, et cetera. Um, it's my experience most of the time, but in this case, Lean was an extremely powerful tool to manage the complexity of this proof. And there were just, uh, yeah, so many things to, Keep in mind, and as Schultz has said, it barely fits in, into your human RAM. And I think it actually didn't fit in my RAM. But um, every time you just get completely stuck, you still see, okay, but here is a lemma, and I understand the next next two lines. So I'll just formalize those two lines. And once you do that, you can sort of forget about them, free up your so they they no longer take up. Uh, so much of your cognitive uh, uh, resources. And then you see, okay, but now I actually understand the next two lines. And so it very much felt like uh, translating a text from Latin to, I, I don't know how many of you had Latin in high school or something like that, but like you, you, you're you working on this text in a foreign language and you look at it the first time and you see, okay, I can't make heads or tails of it, but then you sit down and you translate the first two sentences, and then you realize, oh, now I understand the next two sentences. And I had a very similar experience here, but without lean, I like I tried to understand the global structure of the proof two or three times and failed completely. Only like two weeks before we finished the verification project, the and now I'm talking about this first part that was extremely technical. Only two weeks before we finished that, sort of the global picture became clear to me and I understood how stuff would fit together, et cetera. Yeah, so Lean was very much a proof assistant. And then the third lesson is what makes this proof tick? Um, I didn't really talk about why the proof had to pass through arithmetic, but um, Schultz, uh, himself wrote that uh, by all the discussions and all the tiny little questions that we asked and discussed with him and clarifications that he had to give. Um, and then the, the fact that we needed to formalize a whole bunch of convex geometry, which actually, remember that I said, when you start working with non-convex spaces, which is very much what you need to do when you work with liquid vector spaces and prove this theorem. Well, it, everything is non-convex and it's, uh, it's thrown out of the window. But to prove this core lemma about uh, like the combinatorics that goes into this proof, after you've reduced to uh, power series over the integers, um, you want to use this result from combinatorics and that is proved using uh, convex geometry. So somehow you reduce from this continuous and non-convex setting into a discrete setting that where convexity is back in the picture. And so he said that he understood better how that part of the proof worked and, and why it has to pass through arithmetic. And so as I explained towards the end of the talk, um, there's work in progress. So that I would call this uh, a partial lesson of like which logics uh, you should use to to make the proof structure clear and uh, reduce the, the technical load of the proof. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Um, thank you very much.
Great, thanks very much. Let's all thank Johan. And at this point, we have plenty of time for questions. So please just unmute your mic if you have a question. I see Andy Pitts has his hand raised. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I, have, I have a question. So could you could you just give us a little bit more impression of, about the, the, the actual lean code that you produced? Um, I've got really two questions, I think, about some um, one is is to what extent were you building on on existing libraries i mean was like only 10 percent of, of the work that you did using pre-existing libraries of mathematics or was it some other figure so that's one question and the other question is is if i were to look at the lean code would, would i find it intelligible to the extent that i could I, i'd hope i'd be able to understand as it were the statements of the lemmas even if i didn't understand their proofs or is that too naive yeah, th those are good questions. Um, so the, the repository in which we wrote a formal verification of, of this main theorem um, contains about 90,000 lines of link code. And I didn't compute like how much of the MathLib library we rely on, but it's a lot. So, uh, so Lean's main mathematical library is called MathLib. And certainly we use a whole bunch of stuff about topology, metric spaces, norm de Lean groups, but then also a whole bunch of category theory. Much of the topos theory went directly into MathLib. So it isn't part of the 90,000 lines I mentioned before. And stuff about abelian categories, chain complexes, homological algebra, et cetera. Um, Profinite sets, uh, yeah. So we, we I, I, I never really kept track, actually. So I, maybe I should try to get a better answer uh, to your question at some point. But having having an like an integrated and coherent library on which we could build was absolutely essential for this project. And maybe you can. Do you know how big the math library is in total? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's uh, just over a million lines of code. So, I mean, we certainly don't use all of it, but we use a huge chunk of it, yeah. Um, and then the other question was uh, ah, about the readability. So, especially the, the main theorem that we tried to prove, we worked hard to make this statement very readable. And I think in general, Lean has, uh, the nice feature that statements and definitions are usually quite readable. Um, this sort of breaks down a little bit in category theory, unfortunately, but in algebra and analysis, the statements are extremely readable, even though the proofs are maybe, as you expected, uh, very unreadable. It, it and, does it break down because of the the, the high use of, of ambiguity in, in, in category theory as we write it on paper, or is it some other reason? Yeah. Um, the, right, the fact that you just write equal signs everywhere. But <laughs> <laughs> you, the, yeah. the problem is you, you cannot just write an isomorphism sign either because you want to talk about a specific isomorphism and now you have to give that isomorphism a name and you have to mention that name. Yeah, and so suddenly there are, there are many, like, many things in category theory that we write which are literally don't make sense, but we, exactly. we make sense of them in our yeah, head yeah. because we have a context. And, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty tough test for for a uh, interactive theorem prover. So, so what we did was uh, we wrote a uh, we have a directory called examples with five files in it that are pretty short, extremely well documented and readable. We hope at least that um, sort of give a give a tiny showcase of the objects appearing in the main statement. So, for example, this. Uh, space of Radon measures, we show that it behaves the way you expect of a space of Radon measures. And we show, for example, in, in a file about X groups, that um, the X group of Z modulo NZ with itself is not is Z modulo NZ and not zero, because like just to make sure that 
we didn't define all x groups to be zero to start with, because then the theorem would have been really easy. And so um, we have a file about profinite sets that show that the profinite sets that we use actually behave as profinite sets you would expect. So this is sort of a way to um, make it easy for people who don't know lean to convince themselves that the statement that they see in lean means what they think it should mean. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, Sylvia was next with her hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Really interesting. I guess uh, I was a bit curious about changes uh, that you performed in the formalization process. So you mentioned at some point that you had to change some statements and even proofs of lemmas and auxiliary definitions and stuff. And I was wondering, like, one, did you find some specific actual mistakes or were these changes mainly motivated by some practical means, et cetera? And relatedly to this, is like, how do you see your task when you are formalizing something? Is really the main goal to verify a result or to verify a proof and i guess like this is kind of tricky in some sense because it leads us to think when are some two proofs the same and when they are not uh how can we distinguish between let's say local easily fixable errors and bigger ones etc so i was curious about these kind of issues yeah that's an interesting question um, so first of all, I should say that all the mistakes that we found were really like minor mistakes of the kind that always happen whenever someone writes like a complicated proof that is like tens of pages long. But um, I, there was one example where Schultz was really a bit worried. So th there was a, a proposition, and it's actually this proposition where, uh, where this, it's exactly the point where Reed and I are now stuck, where we cannot just compile down some internal reasoning step, but we really have to exploit the, this norm stuff. Um, so uh, that statement just didn't work. And we discovered this when we had almost written down the proof at some point, certain inequalities just didn't work. And so I think Schultz stayed up basically the full night to fix that, that statement and proof. And then the next morning he came back with another statement and he said, okay, this new statement hopefully still works when, in the proof of the main theorem. And like he, so he updated that proof as well. And he gave a new proof of this statement. And uh, yeah, that worked. Um, but apart from this stuff about print delin resolutions, there we really changed the proof in a, like for, for whatever definition you give of when two proofs are the same, I think those proofs are no longer the same. But in all the other parts, I think we pretty faithfully followed the proof that Schultz had written. Um, and whenever we sort of changed things, it was because there was a typo or, or a minor mistake in his proof. And so we had to fix things. Um, uh, okay, and, and then about the changed definition. Um, yeah, okay. I personally don't find it very serious, but uh, I mean, there are now two kinds of objects and they're just not equivalent. And working with the definition that we give in Lean, is it's just easier to prove things about it. But there, you might have like sort of uh, aesthetic reasons why you might prefer working with the object that Peter defines in his lecture notes. Uh, we just didn't want to bother proving all the theorems about it that we would need to. And so we work with an easier version that is maybe as a category of objects slightly uglier. So. Yeah. Yeah. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, Steve has his hand up. Uh, there we go. Okay. Thanks. Um, thanks. That was really interesting. I have been curious about what's in this. 
project and you made it a lot easier for me than having to read something. Um, I have a question that probably some of the other hot people are wondering too, although I think you've already answered it by saying, oh, well, all the topos theory went into the standard math library. So I guess you're not using the internal logic of the topos and reasoning in lean in that logic because that logic is not going to be the same as lean's, which is classical. Mm -hmm. But that's so that's kind of the hot way that we would try to do it is we would try to axiomatize the specifics of that topos in the internal logic and then use lean to reason kind of internally. Mm -hmm. but, but lean does not really allow us to do that. Did, did you think about trying to do that? Did you make any progress along those lines or was that something that wasn't even on the radar? Um, it, it certainly was on the radar. Mm -hmm. And right, because we, we have to develop all this homological algebra. Yeah. And uh, if you can work with uh, sheaves of abelian groups, just as if they are appealing groups. That is incredibly nice. Yeah, that's what Topos is invented for. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. So um, we thought about like developing some tactics to uh, to make that easier, mm -hmm. and some people even worked on it a bit. But in the end, it wasn't workable enough, and so we just sat down and got our hands dirty and reasoned right. externally. Um, but I, I mean, in some sense, we we got into this rush, like, okay, we're we're going full speed and we don't want to stop. And mm -hmm. so at certain points, we didn't really, we decided, okay, we're just we just want to get this done because it's so cool. Mm -hmm. And but I do think that um, we'll certainly need a second generation of a topos theory library at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, so yeah, so you say like axiomatize the specifics of the topos you work with. Yeah. Um, I also discussed this a bit with Reed, but it's not really clear to us how to actually do that with condensed sets. I think that's an, an open question that is actually quite interesting, but yeah. Um, because what I what I talked about towards the end with like this sheaf semantics thing and the continuous logic, that is not the internal logic of condensed sets. Right. There's more to um, it. It's 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 some very handcrafted specific thing that works with this proof. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. I think it's mostly a negative answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, but but still, it's an answer, and I think that the the basic idea is kind of is there. It's in the air, and maybe someone else will pick up on it and have some ideas how to do it. That's kind of the missing piece. It's a big piece, but it's the missing giant piece for us to start being able to use lean to do hot is that that idea of working internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I completely understand. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I was going to ask that question if Steve didn't. <laughs> and uh, in, in particular, uh, you know, I really like the part where you you tried to interpret some of the statements uh, through a, a certain logic. Um, and then just at the end, you you said it isn't the internal logic. And maybe that explains why some things looked a little surprising to me. Like just as one small thing, you you had something where you you assumed the element that existed was in some multiplicative uh, distance away, k times s, or maybe s mm -hmm. divided by k, or something like that. Yeah, uh, and that didn't seem to match what I would have expected from the internal logic. But is that one right. of the spots where you're deviating from from the internal logic? Um, uh, I I think. It's mostly also with this condensed, uh, sorry, with this continuous logic. Mm -hmm. um, well, th that's certainly also a point, but the like this continuous logic works because we have a norm or a metric, 
Um, but in general, in the topos of condensed sets, you have a topology, but there is no metric in sight. Mm. So th this is very specific to this like particular subcategory. And um, but that subcategory isn't very nice. So it doesn't I like we're using regular logic as in the formulas, regular formulas, etc. But it's not a regular category, actually. So we're we're not actually doing the internal logic of a category, which is frustrating. Um, but we we're still able to like take regular formulas and interpret them and simplify parts of the proof that way. So yeah, like I said, work in progress. We we don't really know what to make of this yet. Yeah. So when um, you say you can compile classical proofs in homological algebra to to what you want to use. How can you do that then if it's if it's not really something where you can well, interpret? I mean the, so so the statements, so we have a soundness theorem for regular logic in interpreted in this category. But it's that soundness proof we need to do by hand because the category is not a regular category. Oh I see. Okay. Good. And um and then so a lot of the statements of in homological algebra, if you unwrap them a bit, they become regular formula. Regular statement statements in regular logic, and um, and then the proof doesn't matter because you have one of these completeness theorems that says, well, if there's a classical proof, then there will also be a, a proof in regular logic. Um, yeah, that's a bit of a hammer, but I'm happy to use a hammer there. Um, yeah, are there more questions? OK, well, let's thank the speaker again. And our next talk is by Andrew Swan on February 9th. I hope to see you there.